100 years ago tomorrow, the Allies would prepare to face the Imperial German Army on the fields of Flanders. It was a brutal battle, truly beyond imagining, and would claim the lives of tens of thousands of people. Passchendaele, the name, the place, will forever be synonymous with human horror. The destruction, the quagmire of the battlefield, and above all, the terrifying massacre of a generation of our young men. Good evening from Tynecourt Cemetery in Belgium, the largest Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemetery in the world. Almost 47,000 men are buried or commemorated here, given the peace and tranquility today. It's difficult to envisage the scene of carnage that unfolded a century ago. Difficult, but important. Over the next two days, events will be held to mark the Third Battle of Ypres, which became commonly known as Passchendaele. And tomorrow marks the exact date a century ago when the first attack was made, the 31st of July. Well, this evening's commemorations will begin just a few kilometers from here in Ypres, the Belgian city at the very heart of Flanders. Winston Churchill said of it, a more sacred place for the British race does not exist. Well, tonight, it's where tribute will be paid to all the people who fought in and around here from 1914 right through until the end of the war. And we'll be remembering in particular the half a million soldiers who were wounded or killed. The first event is going to focus on the men in gate in Ypres. It's worth noting that every single night at 8 o'clock, an act of remembrance known as the last post ceremony is held at the gate. Now, it's a tradition that goes back 89 years. It was started by the Belgians to show their deep felt appreciation of those individual sacrifices made for their nation's freedom. Well, tonight, then, we will witness an altogether bigger event. Their Royal Highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, will attend the commemorations together with their majesties, the King and Queen of the Belgians, accompanied by lots of other VIPs and serving members of the military. They are all here to pay tribute on behalf of their nations to the courage and loss of those men who fought a century ago. Now, later this evening, following that last post ceremony, there'll be a unique event in the city's market square. The imposing facade of a building known as the Cloth Hall will be illuminated with projections and lights, together with some very special live performances from, among others, Dame Helen Mirren and Alfie Bow. Now, the city of Ypres, where all those events are taking place, just under about seven miles from here. Let's join Dan Snow, who's there right now, to tell us more. Yes, Kirsty, I'm standing here right beneath the mighty Menin Gate. I'm on the Menin Road, and this is one of the great arteries of British history. And the reason for that is because during the First World War, hundreds of thousands of British Commonwealth and Allied troops marched here out of medieval Ypres that you can see behind me, through the Menin Gate and out onto the battlefield beyond. The Germans in the summer of 1917 were just two miles that way. So by the time the troops marched through here, they were on a ravaged, devastated battlefield, a place of horror. Now, in about 30 minutes' time, the people that were lucky enough to have been drawn in the special ballot will be processing up the men in road. They'll join the VIPs here for the uh, last post, an enduring homage to the fallen. Uh, Kirsty has been finding out more about the symbolism and the meaning of this extraordinary monument. The land around Ypres saw some of the most sustained fighting of the First World War. In the sea of mud where the battles were fought, many bodies could not be recovered. They simply sank into the earth or were destroyed by shell fire. They died and had no known grave, and their families had nowhere to mourn. Many of those soldiers had made their way to the front line by crossing a bridge that was flanked by two lions. It was called the Menin Gate, and it was beyond the gate that their fate was decided. 
So this place was chosen as a fitting site for a memorial. On its walls, 54,391 names are inscribed. For those soldiers, the men in gate is their tombstone. The Men in Gate Memorial gave the families of the missing a place to come and remember their boys. The people of Ypres had seen the sacrifice of the soldiers at first hand, so in their own tribute, they started playing the last post under the gate. And apart from the years of Nazi occupation, it has been played here every evening since 1929. We bring to life, in fact, each evening the memorial and the names on the gate by sounding the last post in honor of all those who died. Symbolically, Eber stops the daily life. We go back in thoughts to the First World War. Then at 8 o'clock, we sound the attention, followed by the last post to honor and remember the fallen. We need to continue to remember those guys who came sometimes from the other side of the world to rescue Belgium 100 years ago. Their blood is in our soil. So there is always a link between Ypres and all those other cities and countries from where they came. seemed full of respect, profoundly connected, not just to the men who lost their lives, but also to this very community that saw so much horror. As I was listening to the notes of the last post, I started looking at the ground and I was imagining these young men marching through this very street on their way to an unimaginable hell. And it seems not just fitting, but absolutely vital that we stand here and recognize what happened 100 years ago. Well, as we gear up for tonight's ceremonies, we'll be talking about Passchendaele, of course, and the stories of many of those men who traveled from Britain, Ireland, and from around the world to fight in Flanders. And I'm joined now by David Olashoga, who's a broadcaster and historian, and also with us is the author and historian, Richard Van Emden, who has over the years interviewed really very many hundreds of those veterans from the Great War. Um, having just watched that again, and having uh, witnessed the last post ceremony myself, I know you both, I'm sure, will have been many times. David, the thing that struck me is how intensely personal a ceremony it is. It seems to come from the very heart of the people of this area. I think it's an almost unique phenomenon. This isn't an official ceremony. No act of parliament was passed. Nobody from the Belgian government says you must do this. The people of this one small town, 35,000 people, have decided for 80 years to remember what happened in the fields uh, out here. It is an amazing act of remembrance by individuals, personal, from the bottom up, not by governments, that is almost as old as the war itself. It's unique. Uh, Richard, it was so interesting me to me there to, to hear uh, Bernard Motry, who is the man who is in charge of making sure that this uh, ceremony runs smoothly each and every night and seems to be meticulous in the detail of it and turns up every night to make sure it does. He said there, very poignant phrase, he said, their blood is in our soil. What do you make of that? Well, how true it is. I mean, you only have to look at the cemetery behind us here tonight that, uh, uh, I mean, there are men, countless men being dug up every single year. Their bodies are being found, men blown to pieces here. So many of these, the vast majority of these graves here are men who are of unknown um, uh, identity. They are just, they are, nobody has a clue. So it's a, it, it, it really is, the soil here holds the blood of so many nationalities that fought for the Allies. Let's just for a minute then remind ourselves of why it was at this point in the war, a century ago, 
British troops, Allied troops, found themselves in Flanders. What was actually happening at this point? Well, for those months in 1917, this was the most terrible place in the world. This was the place where Britain could lose the war. Because if Ypres is captured, then the Germans would have access to Dunkirk and Calais, the Channel ports, and they could cut Britain off from France, separate the Allies. So this was a place where Britain could, in a matter of days, lose the war. The question nobody really knew was whether this was a place where Britain could win the war. So in 1917, an offensive on around the Ypres salient, the question was, could you push forward break into Belgium, into the open countryside behind the line, and reach the German frontier, which is not far behind. But also, could you reach the U-boat bases on the coast? This is 1917. Britain is beginning to lose the U-boat war. Britain's lifelines are being cut off. Yes, Richard, just to expand on that for a moment, if you would. This was a very important time because the submarines were bombing supplies that were going to, I mean, literally feed the British people. Yes, I think, I mean, probably in historical reflection, we were unlikely to lose the war because of the uh, U-boat menace, but it was, the, we had introduced, for example, the convoy system, which protected many ships uh, crossing the Atlantic as well. So, um, but it was perceived as being extremely dangerous, and uh, it was felt that the offensive here were not just an attempt to, to relieve the, um, to, to secure the coast, but also um, it was about holding the unity of the Allies together. I mean, the French had had a mutiny in April 1917, there was the February Revolution as well in Russia. Britain was the only army at that time that could really be relied upon to, to harry the Germans, and 1917 was a year of harrying the enemy. We have so much to talk about. I know you're both going to stay with us. So tonight, then, we are commemorating this, the Third Battle of Ypres, as we say, more commonly known as Passchendaele. From the early onset of the First World War, the battlefields around Ypres witnessed brutal fighting. That intensified with this offensive. Now, David Oloshoga, who we've just been uh, hearing from, is going to guide us through some of those key moments of this, the Third Battle. Germany's U-boats were sinking British ships at such a rate that it was feared Britain could be starved out of the war. So it was hoped that this battle would break through the German lines and capture the U-boat bases on the Channel coast. Preparations were intense, but they were also dramatic. And that's because two months before the main offensive, 19 mines, deep tunnels, dug underneath the German trenches were exploded. And in an instant, 10,000 German soldiers were killed. Devastating though these detonations were, they were merely meant to prepare the ground for the main offensive. And that came 54 days later, on the 31st of July. The initial attacks were largely successful, and among the many objectives captured was this German signals bunker. And in here, troops sheltered from the German shell fire, but also from the rain. And that was critical. Because at Passchendaele, it very quickly became obvious that the British had a second enemy, the weather. The ancient ditches and channels that drained the water from the fields around Ypres had been almost completely obliterated by three years of artillery bombardments. That meant that while the rain kept falling, the water had nowhere to go. Well, I think there's a limit to almost everything, and the mud of Passchendaele and the sight of seeing men sucked down in this mud, dying in this mud, absolutely finished me off. The conditions on the Ypres battlefield in 1917 were appalling. Men weren't fighting in proper drained trenches. They were living in shell holes full of mud and slime. And there they were being feasted upon by lice and by rats. Well, we were literally living like animals. There was no enlivening uh, sort of attitude in living at all. Although people still fought for their existence, the general opinion was that it wasn't worthwhile. Nothing was worthwhile now. As the fighting continued, a series of attacks were launched that had varying degrees of success. But what they all had in common was high rates of attrition, as every month, tens of thousands of men were wounded, declared missing, or killed. And despite the appalling conditions, Passchendaele, on the 10th of November, was finally captured. 
The British had succeeded in pushing back the German lines, but only by a few miles. The German war machine had certainly been weakened, but there was no end in sight to the First World War. And between them, the two armies that had faced one another in the fields around Passchendaele had suffered half a million casualties. And the bones and the remains of thousands of those men still lie in the soil of the Eve salient. That gives us a wonderful sense of why we were where we were. But of course, it's the third battle of Ypres, David. What, I mean, what happened in the first two to get us to this point? Well, the first battle of Ypres is one of those battles that gives birth to the Western Front. It is one of those battles where there's still a modicum of fluid fighting and the armies are trying to get round each other. This was where the British Army, with a lot of Indian soldiers, hold the line and give birth to the Western Front. The second battle of Ypres is one of the most uh, infamous uh, confrontations of the, of, the, of the First World War because it is the very first moment in 1915 where chemical weapons are used. The Germans unleash their new terror weapon, chlorine gas, and they very nearly break through the lines and capture the town of Ypres. And um, did the battle then meet its objectives of what it actually set out to do? Well, the submarine bases were never captured. Uh, there was never a significant breakthrough into uh, the Belgian countryside behind the lines. Um, and the German frontier was never, was never confronted. But then, a uh, First World War battle that doesn't achieve its objectives, that's pretty much normal. Uh, we're just taking a look now at a splendid scene. This is uh, the band of the Welsh Guards just marching their way through the lovely little town of Ypres. They're just getting into position at the Menin Gate for this evening's ceremony. There they are. What a colour and what a sight. Um, let's talk for a moment, Richard, about General Haig. For those of us who feel we know a little bit about history, his is a name that seems to, certainly in the his historian community, strike up quite a lot of controversy. What were his aims in this third battle of Ypres in Passchendaele? Well, I mean, he wanted a breakthrough. I mean, he he wanted a breakthrough on the Somme. He wanted a breakthrough here. Um, I mean, he was well aware of the fact that his army was the only army at that time that could really launch an offensive against the Germans. And his decision early on in 1917 was to harry the Germans at every opportunity. He'd done it at Arras. There was a huge success at Messines. And now here at 3rd Ypres, he was going to have another go. <coughs> and try and, and, and force the Germans back. And you've got to look as well, you've got to see, I mean, Ypres was so important to the British. It had become, the losses at first Ypres, second Ypres, it becomes so important to us. He wanted to ensure that the Germans could no longer oversee British forces from the high ground, push them back, save Ypres. When you say, and I can see you nodding there, Dave, when you say so important, important beyond the battle itself, important because it spoke of something to people at home, did it? It had become symbolic. Right. It had become what Verdun was to the French. It was a city that, well, a town, that if it had fallen, it would have in itself been a crisis. It would have been seen as a major defeat. Probably more strategically, more symbolically than strategically at times, Ypres was sacred to the British. And Richard, just briefly in terms of the loss of life, I mean, you know, when I say these figures, when I reel them off, 500,000 people either injured or killed, was the sacrifice worth it is the question that, that we now ask ourselves. Is that a fair question? Well, it is. I mean, it's, we look at this so much with the benefit of hindsight. You know, was this operation uh, a, a sensible idea on the, on the 30th of July? Yes, it was. You know, was it, you know, it was, it was, it was time to go. It was a sensible um, uh, offensive to be had at that time. Was it sensible to continue it after the 6th of October when the rains poured down here and this place became a morass? It's debatable. The casualties are just a byproduct of horrendous attritional warfare. Well, of course, there are uh, no longer any survivors of the Great War, but their powerful testimonies do, thankfully, remain tonight. The special live event in Ypres Market Square will feature the stories and the voices of very many veterans who fought right here a century ago. Andrew Bowie was just 19 when he came to Passchendaele to fight. Here's his story. <laughs> I had to go there, as uh, as I was a certain age, and I was I was no hero. Don't think anything like that. We were there to take Passchendaele Ridge. You could tell that there was that anxiety in the air. What was going to happen after 
daylight tomorrow. When it came to attack, the whole hell was let loose with the Germans, because they were on the ridge, you see, and we were in the flat below, and they couldn't miss with their machine guns. I didn't go very far. None of us got far. We just stopped. They couldn't go. The fire was so intense, they just blasted off the earth. When we had a chance, this big shell hole was near us, and MacDonald and I crawled into it. We just sat there with your feet in water, ankles up, and sitting in mud. Couldn't see anybody outside. They were all died or wounded or something. It was just a bloody massacre. We were in the shell hole for two or three days. We couldn't see a way out because this place was being sprayed repeatedly with machine gun fire. We finished off with two rifles together, ground sheets over the top, and pretending we were stretcher bearers. The Germans did not fire on us, luckily, and uh, that was uh, the great escape for us. Six hundred and eighty men went in as a battalion, and uh, the roll call us when I heard it. It was 39. The feeling I got was it was waste of life. I felt that it was just a waste of human life, sending men in to take in a place like that. Well, David and Richard are still with me. We've been joined now by the Belgian historian, Professor Sophie de Schartreiber. Thank you for joining us. I'll come to you in just a second, Professor. But first of all, Richard, you recorded that around about 20 years ago yes. with Andrew Bowie. I don't know how recently you've seen it, but what are your thoughts this evening on watching it? It's a very, very powerful first-person testimony. It is, and I, I have a tremendous emotional response to seeing that film. Um, Andrew was a, a remarkable man. Um, <laughs> I mean, he suffered the hell of Passchendaele because he's talking about the end of the battle. He's talking about October when this place was horrific, and I mean horrific. Men just drowned here in the, in the appalling mud. And he suffered three days of, of, of incredible torture. Um, but it didn't mar his life. I mean, I have to say that. You know, he said he saw it as a waste of life. Yes. But he made something of his life. He went. He didn't. He, he, he didn't finish him as an individual. And uh, and uh, he went on. And he had. He, he he was just a lovely, lovely man. But it's to see him now again after all these years. It's 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 wonderful. And a very important, significant, I think, piece of film to have. Sophie, if I can come to you, we've been talking up until now a lot about Allied troops and British people. I I wonder if you can give me a sense of the experience of the people of Flanders and Belgium at this point in the war. What was happening? How did they, well, what was their response? Well, the, the salient, well, the word is uh, quite relevant today, but the salient characteristic of Belgium in war is that Belgium was invaded. Yes. And that is really going to shape uh, the Belgian experience of war. So the British army is here in a corner uh, that has not been conquered. And that sense was very strong. It was a very so, uh, strong sense of part of Belgium, only part of Belgium being not invaded. So there is a very strong sense of the front being about something, about rolling back an invasion, about rolling back uh, a, a military occupation. And that sense was still very prevalent, uh, was extremely prevalent uh, among the Belgians in 1917, precisely because around that time, forced labor had, in, had been introduced among the civilians. Um, exploitation had reached uh, a very great and very cruel heights. Civilians were being, were being used. Um, lives were being torn apart. Uh, and the Belgian army too, which held the front to the north uh, of, of uh, Ypres, um, well, there was a strong sense, in, in spite of war weariness, there was a very strong sense that it was absolutely crucial 
to hold that front. Uh, we just saw the Belgian Guard, indeed, as you were speaking there, wa walking up Menenstrasse and marching uh, towards the Menin Gate in preparation yeah. for this evening's ceremony. It is it, difficult, David. I mean, it's fascinating to listen to. You put it in such great contact, context. It is very difficult to imagine how important it must have been to the people of Belgium to see British and Allied troops on their land trying their damnedest to defend the territory of Flanders. I think almost almost all of Belgium is in German hands. As Sophie said, it is under an armed occupation. This is a tiny corner of the country, all that's left. It is as, as if all of Britain, other than Cornwall, has been colonized, has been conquered. And you have to defend in the dream of pushing back, mm. of reuniting with your brothers. Yeah. The soldiers fighting here, the Belgium soldiers to the north of here, their families are on the other side of that German line, in the occupation, suffering the forced labor that Sophie's talking about. We'll chat more. Um, Later on then, there will be 200 descendants who will be joining the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and the King and Queen of the Belgians alongside others for this special last post ceremony at the Menin Gate this evening. And Dan Snow uh, met three of the guests. Well, yes, I'm joined now by three people who have a very special connection with the events of 100 years ago. I've got Christine, Ruth and Jan. Who are you guys here to remember? Edmund Galetti, who was our grandfather, and he died at the Battle of Pilcombe Ridge on the 31st of July, 1917. That was actually 100 years ago, tomorrow. And how old was your father when his father was killed out here? He was just a baby. He was just a year old when his father died because he'd been born in 1916. You've got a very special letter, haven't you, from his commanding officer. Do you want to yes. read a little bit out? <clears throat> to all of us, his death is a great loss. But our share of loss, we can measure the greatness of yours and venture to send you our deepest sympathy in this your great bereavement. You have the consolation of knowing he did his duty nobly and to your little son, his father should always be a proud memory. Well, it's such a special thing to have that letter in the family. Jan, what's it like being here, seeing his name up on that wall and, and looking round Ypres today? It's just incredible. It feels a real privilege and in fact we, it's, it's a pilgrimage really. We're here to honour not just our grandfather but our father as well who really just didn't know him any more than we knew him. So it's massive to be here and um, you know this, this whole event is, is just fantastic. Thank well you. thank you so much for joining us today and sharing the stories about your grandfather. Thank you. Thank you. Well, these ladies will be uh, enjoying, I'm sure, the uh, events that are taking place uh, later at the Kloss Hall. Right now, let's take a look at what's happening at the Menin Gate. A splendid scene there. We've got the Welsh Guards band. The 1st Battalion of the Welsh Guards were at Passchendaele from the beginning, from the 31st of July, 1917. One man who has a very big job this evening is Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Roberts. He is the Senior Director of Music and uh, he will be doing his best to conduct all of the music this evening, no small task. He is single-handedly overseeing four different groups of musicians that will be participating in the ceremony. The Welsh Guards Band, as we see there, the Central Band of the RAF, we'll be seeing them in a while, and the Band of Her Majesty's Royal Marines Plymouth, and also the National Youth Choir of Scotland. They're in fine voice, I've heard the rehearsals, and that will be something to look forward to. Well, the, uh, the First World War is now, of course, beyond living memory, but the testimonies, we've been talking about them already, of those who fought mean that the horrors will hopefully never be forgotten. The following film is a testament to the remarkable story of one ordinary man who fought at Passchendaele and became something of an icon of his generation. During the four years of war, over five million men from Britain and the Empire fought on the Western Front. They were ordinary men, destined to fight an extraordinary war. Such was the pain of that doomed generation that it must never be forgotten. So year after year, we remember. The nation honors those who served. Eventually, from all those who fought in the trenches, only one man remained. His name was Harry Patch. The first time he spoke publicly about the war was in 1998, when he was 100 years old. There were five of us in the team. There was number one on the gun, 
It was me with the spare parts, and they were carrying the ammunition. You were a team. It's a difficult thing to describe the friendship there was between us. We each knew where the other came from and uh, what their lives had been, where they were educated. We belonged to each other, if you understand. When it came to the point when we went into action, really, I was scared stiff. We were on a piece of old ground and the whiz bag burst just behind me. The last three who were the ammunition carriers, they must have been right back where the shell burst. I still forget the three I lost behind me. That upsets me more than anything. Eighty years after, I always remember it. That is the trouble now, talking to you. You are making me relive what happened years and years ago. It's woken up bad, terrible memories. Over the next 11 years, Harry confronted the memories that tormented him and became a figurehead for remembrance. When he passed away on the 25th of July, 2009, we lost our last living link to the trenches of World War I but the legacy of Harry's generation will last forever. The memories of Harry Patch there, and I should tell viewers at home that David turned to Richard during that and said, you should be very proud of that, because there, there's a reason he was saying it, which was, you got Harry Patch to talk about things in his life that he had never before discussed, even with his family, the people he loved the most. Why do you think he spoke to you? Why do you think at that point he was ready to talk? Because he knew it was two minutes to 12 in his life. He was so aware of the fact that he was going to take this to the grave with him. He, and it was a monkey on his back. I mean, when I first met him, he told me his entire war in five minutes. And he said, that's it. I don't think there's anything more I can tell you. And I said, well, can I ask you some more questions? And when I asked him afterwards, I said, we would love to film you about this. Is that possible? And he agreed. And it's interesting, he said on that, that short clip there, you're making me talk about things. Yes. I wasn't making him talk. I spoke to him and I said, if we bring a crew down here and we film you, will you open up? Will you tell it? And he said, yes, I will. And it was incredibly painful for him. Incredibly. It was, but you could see as he talked about it, and not just on that occasion, but on other occasions, slowly, this monkey had been on his back for, for 80 years, began to lift. And I'll tell you something, just before he died, I think he actually wanted to die here because he said to me, he said, take me back to Passchendaele. He was 100, just coming up to his 111th birthday. There was no way he could have come back. And he went like this and he pulled out his passport. Did he? Yeah. And I think he wanted to come back here and die. But he was happy. He, by that time, he'd got over his war. And the last couple of times we brought him here, he was so much more at peace than he was the first time he came here and he couldn't get off the bus for crying. And when he came here, did he talk while he was here or were the memories internal and personal while he was actually in Flanders? Well, the first time we came here, we took him to Pilkham Ridge where he'd been on the uh, 16th of August. And he couldn't really talk about it. I mean, he, he, took, he wept. And he wept. He couldn't even get off the bus at first. And then, but slowly but surely, he would let us in that little bit more, tell us a little bit more about what had, what had happened to him. But it traumatised that even just before he died, he said to me, he said, have you ever handled a man without a head? And I said, are you talking about the Second World War? Because he worked in, in the Second World War. And he said, no, no, the First World War. And I said to Harry, I said, I think maybe this is the time to leave that. And we're just looking at pictures there of, of Harry indeed on a visit to a German cemetery. David, uh, that is an interesting idea that somebody is willing to confront just 
not just the horror of what he and his comrades and his friends went through, but what happened on the other side too. That seems to have been a great strength in the man, the fact that he was able to confront that. I think he was aware that he had been through hell and that the, an equal hell had been experienced by the men on the other side of the line. Quite a few of the veterans, I met quite a number, nowhere near as many as, as Richard, they were aware that they had killed as well as seen their comrades die. There was, among many of them, a sense that what they had been through was something that should never have been asked of any generation. There was not a pacifism, but a sense that war, especially this war, was something that had to be regretted and lamented and not glamorized. Uh, Sophie, as a Belgian and a historian, when you hear Richard say that he was speaking to this man at more than 100 years old, who felt that above all else, in all the life that he'd lived, he would have been happiest and most comfortable coming back here to die. That is, that's an extraordinary thing. It must be almost a, a strange thing for a, Belg a Belgian person to hear. As a historian and a Belgian, what do you make uh, of that? Well, I have interviewed Belgian veterans, yes. and uh, they have said similar things. So it is uh, probably um, the defining experience, yes. or at least it, it may be remembered as such in, in extreme old age. Uh, I, I would also like to refer to something uh, that David said about uh, the German soldiers dying yes. in the salient. Uh, their memorial footprint is much smaller. So the landscape here tells a story, but it tells a lopsided story. Because you wonder, where are the Germans? You, you miss them. Uh, they're there, but you have German war cemeteries that are much smaller than Tynkot yet hold many more remains. Do you think that that is something potentially in the future that people will be willing to explore or do you think that is buried with the history? You think if that's this, in the time If to come? this is to be as it should be, a European memory, then yes, this is the way to go. I should tell you, I should remind you that uh, later this evening there is a, a very special live event that is going to pay tribute to these men we've been talking about, these men who fought in the fields of Flanders. Hosted by Dame Helen Mirren, it'll feature performances, songs, poetry and even some comedy. Dan met with Ian Hislop, who's taking part in the event later. Ian, what can we expect from you and the team tonight? Well, um, it's the commemoration of the Battle of Passchendaele, and uh, we're doing extracts from the play The Wipers Times, which my friend Nick Newman and I wrote. And the actors are over here doing selected bits, which is particularly good because our lot, the Sherwood Foreters, were actually at the Battle of Passchendaele. What was the Wipers Times? It was unbelievably a satirical newspaper produced in the trenches and it started right here in Ypres. Um, two British officers and their sergeant, who uh, turned out to be a printer, um, started a newspaper and it ran throughout the rest of the war from 1916 right to the armistice. Ian Hislop. What first attracted you to the writers of a satirical newspaper in the trenches? It's funny you should ask that question. Here were two men in the worst possible circumstances producing what I think is a brilliantly funny paper under um, duress, under threat of death. I mean, this was the front line. They didn't do it at home and then send it up. This was on the front line. At one point, the editor corrected page proofs in a trench before going over at the Battle of the Somme. I mean, that's a proper editor. I mean, these guys did it for real. Ian Hislop, you do it for real too. Thank you very much. Kirsty, back to you. Thanks very much, Dan, and thanks to Ian. We'll be hearing more from Ian a little later on. Let's go uh, back to the men gates now and just see what's happening there. A very special evening. It is a commemoration that takes place every single evening, but tonight a rather bigger and more special event, and we see the UK Defence Secretary Michael Fallon taking his place there. The welcoming party for all of these significant people include Sir Tim Lawrence. He's the Vice Chairman of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. He's of course also the husband of the Princess Royal, Princess Anne. And we can also see there uh, the Mayor of Ypres, that's Jan Dournes. He was born in a village nearby and this will be a proud evening and an important evening for him as he watches these people gather under this historic monument. Well, with me still are David and Sophie and Richard. Um, Sophie, I'm keen to try to explore a little bit more of the history of this place. And I'm talking here not about when the battles were here, but when people were just going about their daily lives. The first thing that struck me, and it was the first time I'd been to Ypres this week, 
was to walk and suddenly see the cloth hall. I immediately thought it was a cathedral. So ornate and so beautiful and so significant is it as a piece of architecture. And yet, it's got this very simple name, the cloth hall. That's right. Because that was the industry of the area. Can you just put that in some sort of context? Yes. Me? Yes, the cloth hall does look like a cathedral. Yes. It is, in fact, the largest Gothic civic building in Europe. Um, and why is that? Why does it look like a cathedral? Although what, what was done there was trading in woolens. It was uh, the heart, the thriving heart uh, of, of the woolen trade, with, of course, with, with England and then, and then across Western Europe. So if you look at medieval Europe, um, you could see almost a spine of cities going from, from England, and then you have Flanders, uh, you have Paris, and then it goes all the way down to northern Italy which is in many ways uh, this, this long spine of trade, exchange, communication, knowledge, discovery. And so there is a very proud memory of that, even though by the late 19th century, Ypres was no longer um, the heart of things as it had been. And so the rebuilding, I mean, the cloth hall lay in ruins yes. at the end of the Second World War. Uh, you know, that was um, not just a practical problem for the people of this area, but somehow hugely significant symbolically. It was very significant. The, the whole idea was that it stood for urban liberties, it stood for trade, it stood for exchange, it stood for openness. All of that simply had to be rebuilt, even if in the event it meant uh, prioritizing that kind of rebuilding over rebuilding houses for ordinary people. Many of them actually lived in barracks well into the 1920s. However, it was absolutely a priority. Uh, it, it, it was crucial. The picture that we saw there is, is really of a, a pile of rubble with nothing but sort of almost yeah. two faces of the tower still standing, of one of the main towers standing. When it was proposed that a lot of effort, and indeed I'm guessing a heck of a lot of money, was put into rebuilding it, the people of Ypres and Flanders said, good idea if they're living yes, in barracks? Yes, it had to be. Well, um, first of all, uh, this, we're not in a social democracy yet, so their opinion was quite simply not being asked. They may have muttered, but there were no channels for their muttering, so we don't know. Uh, I'm sure they weren't very happy, but it could well be that the very idea that they could lay such lames upon the state was, was not quite yet articulated, sadly. But anyway, there we are. We're going to take a little look now at uh, the descendants' procession that is uh, taking place towards the Menin Gate. Since the 1920s, families have come to Ypres to visit the Menin Gate and to commemorate the lost dead, those who had no grave and no tomb at that point. And we see them processing up Menenstrasse. They are led by the Royal Irish Pipes and Drums and in fine fettle on what is a fine evening. The sun has come out. It's been a pretty rainy day, but the clouds have parted and we have a fine evening for the commemoration. And David, I want to ask you about these families. You know, there is a great question as to why people still come. As I say, people have been coming since the 1920s. In the beginning, of course, entirely understandable because these were mothers, sisters, aunts who wanted to know where their young men had gone and wanted somehow to connect with their death. But why do you think it is, and we have hundreds of them here this evening, that each and every year tens of thousands of people come to this tiny town in ostensibly the middle of nowhere to connect with that event? I think it's one of the great questions of British history. A uh, hundred years ago, people would say this would be remembered in a hundred years' time, but I don't know whether they were confident. Wars, most wars are forgotten. This war hasn't been. Normally when the generation who fought leave us, wars are put, put behind us. This hasn't happened. In, in the 1980s there was talk that even the Remembrance Day ceremony at the Cenotaph would eventually die out. That is unimaginable now. The First World War has become part of who we are. I don't think anyone can give you an answer about why, yes. but it, it is part of, of, of European history and British history and the, the idea of not commemorating it is unimaginable. It's, it is an intrigue in many ways why a century on we're still doing it. I wonder, Richard, about, uh, I mean, I know you have a, a, a great depth of information about many of the family stories, and one of the stories that I was reading about were the Seabrook brothers. They were um, three Australian brothers who died. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yes, I mean, there were three, three brothers um, from Sydney in Australia that came over here, and they fought at the uh, Battle of Menin Road the 20th of September and all three uh, were uh, mortally wounded, two dying 
Uh, very soon afterwards, uh, their bodies were lost, never recovered, and they are on the Menin Gate. And the third one died of his wounds, I think, the following day, and is buried at Listenhook uh, Cemetery, just a few miles at the back of, uh, of Ypres. So all three brothers effectively killed at the same time, at the same place. And uh, some of those commemorated on the gate, they were under the age of 18. Am I right in saying that? Yes, I mean, I've, I've had a great interest in, in the number of boys who served underage in the First World War. Uh, there are certainly 10, 15-year-olds uh, on the Menin Gate, but of course the Commonwealth War Graves only hold 50% of, of uh, ages on their website, so you could, you could fairly well uh, speculate that there would be at least twice that, and probably more. Many boys served under assumed names. Parents also had the habit of rounding up ages when they were asked how old their son was if they, if they wished to reply. They often thought, well, he was born in 1899, he died in 1915. Oh, he was 16, but actually he might still have been 15. So you see a lot of that going on too. So there are a lot of very young lads, but obviously the higher the age you go, the more there are. So a lot of 17-year-olds on there, lots of 16-year-olds, and lots of 18-year-olds, because of course to serve overseas at the time you had to be 19. We're seeing there the splendid sight of the Royal British Legion standards and also the Belgian standards. And as we say, this is a procession of the descendants making their way towards the men in gate. And David, can you just give us a little bit more, some, some of the facts and figures behind the men in gate? Because as we saw in the earlier film, of course, this is a commemoration. Before, it used to just be there, there was the bridge and there were the lions on the bridge and that was it. But here at the Menin Gate now, when people come to visit, what is it that they are seeing? What are they witnessing now? I think they're seeing the transformation of what was one of the number of gates of medieval Ypres turned into an international place of pilgrimage. Those 53,000 names are the names of people who haven't got a proper burial, who don't have a headstone. The reason they don't have a headstone is because the nature of the warfare, the nature of the landscape that it was fought on meant that they were atomized by explosives or that they literally drowned in mud. I think the scale of that monument is in balance to the horror of what happened. We needed to build something here to try to acknowledge how awful this had been. And Sophie, there is no, as I was standing there, there's no pomposity, there's no grandiosity, there is something mm -hmm. that is almost spare and noble about this. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, it is not a performance. It doesn't matter that there is no audience. And, and many people here remember decades where uh, on many, many, many evenings uh, th there was nobody or maybe two people, somebody walking a dog. It doesn't matter. It is not a performance. Um, and, and precisely on those evenings could you actually sense how brilliant the ritual is because it doesn't tell you what to think about the war one way or another but it is being done every day so so the brilliance the significance it lies in the sheer dogged dailiness of it let's think then for a little bit let's cast our minds back a hundred years ago and just beyond that to the information that was reaching people in Britain what did people know about what was happening out here how much did they know? Well, I think by 1917, people understand right. the nature of the war. Right. In 1916, when Kitchener's army of volunteers had gone to war, there's still a certain amount of naivety about what the Western Front is. There's also, there's control of newspapers, there's a certain degree of censorship, but the censorship can't disguise the lists of the dead in the newspapers. Right. So people after the Somme know what the First World War is. They don't, might not know the grimmer, nastier details, but they know that the Western Front is a slaughterhouse and they know that the Ypres salient is the worst place in the world. And so on that basis, sorry, you wanted mm -hmm. to come in there, Sophie. Well, I just want to say the interesting thing is they know it's a slaughterhouse. They know how many dead uh, are, are falling uh, every day. But at the same time, you have this strange sense that it is, it is not testimony to, it is testimony to how horrible it is, but it's also an emblem of national resolve somehow. You know, that's the mentality about that war that explains why Britain stuck it out so uh, well. Richard, how much did you find that when you were talking to men who had fought here? Because, of course, we're not talking, as we are now, about a highly individualized culture where everybody is playing out their own story. This was a very, very different time when people thought, I'm not sure yes. I agree with it. I know I may be going to hell, but I'm just going to get on with it because that's what's expected of me. Well, a lot of veterans, uh, in fact, they spelt it out to me sometimes. They, say these, they used to say to me, D-U-T-Y, duty. And they had an enormous store in that word. 
for them, you know, it, for, the, for some of them, of course, it was country right or wrong. For the majority, it was country right, in as much as they believed that the um, that the task that they were undertaking was legitimate, um, and so they were willing to do their, their utmost for that. And they knew the horrors. I mean, Harry Patch, his brother had been on the Western Front a year before Harry ever arrived, two years before Harry had arrived here. He knew he was under no illusions as to what he was going to go into. But he was determined that, OK, I'm being conscripted, I've got to go, but I will do my level best. And you can say that about the vast, vast majority of troops who came here. David, can you give us a snapshot of uh, the political situation at Britain at this Pretty precise time, actually, if, if you can. Well, 1917 had begun with a series of feelers for peace. The American President Wilson had suggested being a broker for peace. The Catholic Church had come out uh, as offering its services to broker peace. And there had even been a note from the Germans suggesting that they might move towards uh, finding a way of ending this war. One of the great questions about the First World War, we spent 100 years trying to debate why this war began. The other equally important question is why in 1917 is it not are we not able to stop this war 1916 has been a catastrophe on the on Verdun the French and the Germans had slaughtered each other on the Somme Britain had lost a generation in 1917 there's a desperate urge to bring this war to an end but no one seems to know how to do it okay well I don't know if historians are like economists I don't know if I'm gonna ask you and I'm gonna get three different opinions but I'm interested to explore that just a little bit more what is your theory as to why that could not be reached if indeed there was intent in certain political areas in each and every side of the war to try to reach it. Why did it I not happen? I think the grim calculation is, is by 19, end of 1916, so many men have died on all sides that to bring the war to an end, to find a compromise peace, would suggest to many people that those men had died for nothing. And so the temptation was to keep fighting because victory would justify the deaths of those who'd already died. In a way, you end up throwing more lives onto the pyre. That, I think, is the terrible calculation you would become trapped I, I, I mean, if I could just inject sure. that, I mean, of course, Haig, all the intelligence Haig was receiving at this time was that Germany was on its last legs. One more push and we might be able to win this war. And that had come directly from 1914, from the fighting in, at Ypres, then when the Germans came so close to winning the war, so close, to, well, certainly so close to decisively breaking the British line. And Haig had seen that. And he thought, I'm never going to make that mistake. If I think, if my intelligence is telling me I can push and gain victory, I will go for it. And that's what happened here. That's why he pushed for as long as he did, in the belief that actually he could now successfully bring the war to a conclusion. Sophie, listening to this, you're, you think what? Well, I think it is because uh, neither side is willing to compromise over invaded areas. 40 million Europeans are living under military occupation. Um, and so the Allies do not want to let this stand, whereas uh, those powers that have overrun those areas have absolutely no intention of relinquishing them. So that's where it stands. And we see now uh, British Prime Minister Theresa May walking up towards uh, the Menin Gate, here of course in her official capacity as the Prime Minister, but uh, she is also personally connected to this event. Her paternal grandfather was Tom Brazier, who served in the First World War as a sergeant major in the 4th Battalion, the King's Royal Rifles. And indeed, her grandfather Tom was awarded the Military Cross in 1915. His regiment was present at the Western Front for the Second Battle of Ypres. She's speaking there to Commander Tim Lawrence. She's also talking to the Secretary of State for uh, Culture and now to the Mayor of Ypres. She's shaking the hand of Benoit, who we heard from earlier in one of our films. I was mentioning he is the man that makes sure that each and every night, when there are not VIPs and dignitaries and standards, that this ceremony of the last post goes ahead with dignitaries. With, with dignity rather than dignitaries, and he, uh, he does a pretty good job. I spoke to him the other night, and he is a man of great precision and respect, as well as great height. And for this small town, Sophie, I know it is used to, and indeed Benoit said to me, well, we had Her Majesty the Queen here a few years ago. You know, this is just another event, and we will take it in our stride. 
do you think for this little Belgian town it feels like a big occasion right now? Do you think the centenary, a hundred years on from what they went through, will be a moment for them to, to take a breath as well as to make the preparations and host such a grand event? Yes, to be sure. Um, it, it's also very obvious that um, British war memory, uh, which, which has this extremely coherent narrative of the war and this extremely convincing aesthetic, you know, the poppies, the Portland Stone, the poems, has really pretty much taken over war memory, including in Belgium. And do you think also there must, I mean, as there is of course in every town, every city and every country, people of, of differing views who think it is time to move on. Is that something that is heard often in Belgium? Do people say we, we need to, all right, we've acknowledged the past for long enough, we need to move on from that? I'm sure you would hear it, although they would not make themselves terribly popular around here, I think. <laughs> yes, indeed. It seems a, a busy time that thrives on the business that this inevitably, the tourism, brings for them. And so we have many uh, special guests coming this evening. We, at one point, will be welcoming the King and Queen of the Belgians, and before that, we're expecting to see the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. And so it is a fine night in Ypres. All preparations have gone smoothly. The dignitaries are gathered. The descendants are gathered. The bands are massed. And the preparations have all gone very smoothly indeed. It is a fine evening. And David, as you look, as somebody who is so familiar with every aspect, I don't think there's a question I could throw at you that you couldn't answer. I get that impression. When you see an event like this taking place, when you see what is essentially people connecting with history, that's an interesting moment, surely. This, this event, this daily event at, at Menin, is a, is a communion between generations. Nobody on, whose name appears on this wall is somebody who, who is alive today, we know that. But those connections to the generations are they're, they're, in, they're permanent now. I should let people know that we're just uh, looking at the Belgian Minister of Defence, Stephen van der Poot, is just uh, taking up his place and shaking the hands of the welcoming committee. Sorry, do carry on, David. But where this ceremony is taking place is where hundreds of thousands of men marched to the guns, to the trenches, to the battlefields. They walked where the dignities are walking now. That sense that this, this journey that they went through has to be remembered is very strong. And of course, there, mm. very distinctively, we see the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge making their way up Menenstrasse and towards the gate. And the Duchess accompanied the Duke to Belgium back in uh, 2014 for a series of events to commemorate 100 years since the start of World War I. The Duke visited Belgium and attended the British-Irish commemorative service and reception to mark the centenary of the Battle of Messines. So the Duke and Duchess being introduced there to the welcoming party of Karen Bradley, Secretary of State for Culture, Sir Tim Lawrence, who is the Vice Chairman of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and in a moment, the Mayor of Ypres, along with Benoit Motry. It was last Thursday that the Duke carried out his last ever shift as an air ambulance pilot with the East Anglian Air Ambulance Service. He served with them since March of 2015. And by their side is the British ambassador to Belgium, Alison Rose. And here now we welcome the King and Queen of the Belgians.
And as monarch, the king, King Philippe, is commander-in-chief of the Belgian army, and he himself has a strong military background. In the Belgian Air Force, he was indeed a fighter pilot. Every evening, the city of Ypres falls silent at 8 o'clock and the last post is played by the buglers of the Last Post Association. With the sounding of this bugle call, the 250,000 British and Commonwealth soldiers who were killed on the Ypres salient during the First World War are remembered. The battlefields of the salient came to define the war for many British and Commonwealth soldiers. The defence of the city at such great cost meant that it became hallowed ground. Winston Churchill said of Ypres, a more sacred place for the British race does not exist in all the world. It was from here, along the Menin Road, that so many marched towards the front line. After the war, when a location was being sought for a lasting memorial to these men, it seemed fitting for it to be built by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission in this place. Today, the Menin Gate records almost 54,000 names of the men who did not return home. The missing with no known grave. Members of our families, our regiments, our nations, all sacrificed everything for the lives we live today. During the First World War, Britain and Belgium stood shoulder to shoulder. One hundred years on, we still stand together, gathering as so many do every night in remembrance of that sacrifice. Thank you for the honour that you do us.
every time we stand here under the Menin Gate, we feel overwhelmed by the immensity of the sacrifice of the men whose names surround us. And when a fresh breeze whispers through the arches, it touches something inside all of us. It is as if the fallen were telling us, we did this for you. Indeed, they came to our country from near and far to defend our freedom alongside our own soldiers. Ever since, we have expressed our gratitude to these heroes, and a hundred years have passed without it be being diminished. I am proud of the people of Ypres and of other places on the Western Front, conscious of the sacrifices made by those who fought on Belgian soil, they pay homage daily on behalf of all Belgian citizens. The last post ceremony held here each evening is a tradition founded and maintained by the local community. It has taken place more than 30,000 times since 1928 and is an important part of the identity of the city of Ypres. Members of the Last Post Association organized the ceremony day after day on busy summer evenings and quiet winter nights. For your dedication, we thank you. Passendal was a struggle for freedom our common freedom, the freedom we enjoy today. At the time, it was a fight for land, every possible meter of land. Blood soaked the earth. The bodies of the thousands of soldiers who remained here forever became one with the earth. So your graves on our soil have become our graves on your soil. In the same way, your Menning Gate has become our gate. And our cities and countryside on the Western Front will forever be a part of our common history. This battle, a hundred years ago, makes the bond between our countries strong and everlasting. At our gathering today, let us, together with a new generation, renew our commitment to the fallen, to use the freedom we owe to them in a way that honors their immense sacrifice.
They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. And so the wreath-laying ceremony begins with the King of the Belgians, King Philippe, and the Duke of Cambridge.
the turn now of Stephen van der Poot, who's the Belgian Minister of Defence, and he will be accompanied by the British Prime Minister, Theresa May. Laying wreaths now will be Carl de Carlois, who is the Governor of West Flanders, and Sir Tim Lawrence. Following on from them, Jan Duenas, who is the mayor of Ypres, and Benoit Motry, the chairman of the Last Post Association of the time. And now, in this final grouping, a large grouping, we see and about 19 members of the National Citizenship Service and we'll witness them handing wreaths to representatives from various combatant nations that served in the First World War. The countries we see being represented this evening are Algeria, Australia, Bangladesh and Canada, the Democratic Republic of Congo, France and Germany. We'll also witness an Indian representative among the various colonies of the British Empire at the time, India contributed the largest number of men with approximately 1.5 million recruited during the war and up until December 1919. There are also representatives from Ireland, Malta, Montserrat, New Zealand, Pakistan and Morocco. 24,300 Moroccans served in the French army during the First World War.
When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. And so the royal party now meets the Menengate's last post buglers. These are five men who are part of an eight-strong voluntary team who alternates their responsibility for the nightly task of performing the last post. And the men they're meeting this evening are Jan Carlemagne, Tony Dizot, Raf de Combo, Christoph Mills, Rick von Arkovica, and Derek von Arkovica. And the 90 singers that we enjoy this evening congratulate themselves so far on a job well done, I think. They're between 16 and 24 years of age, and they were supervised today by their conductor, 
Andrew Nunn. And there we see the Prime Minister's message on the wreath that she laid tonight at the Menin Gate. And that is His Royal Highness Prince William's wreath. Now, the Queen of the Belgians' grandfather was a sergeant in the Belgian army. He was indeed captured by the Germans and spent much of the war as a prisoner of war in a German war camp. So for many of the people here, and as we mentioned earlier, for Theresa May too, personal memories connected to this very civic and official occasion. And there we are, the last post then has been sounded at the Menin Gate, just as it is each and every night. Well, David Olashoga, Professor Sophie de Sharp Driver and Richard Van Emden are still with me here. We're at Tynecourt Cemetery, just uh, a few kilometres away from Ypres. Um, Sophie, I want to come to you um, first of all. We've, we've spoken a lot about what uh, this commemorative moment and what the men in gate means to the world. But you as a Belgian watching that tonight, what was going through your head as you were watching the ceremony? Well, as I was watching the cer ceremony, I was reminded of something that David said earlier about uh, the, the communion of today's generation um, with the generation of, of those men. And um, not only as a Belgian, but, but more in general, um, I'm struck by the fact that here was an entire generation put in uniform and put in harm's way. And in fact, we have traveled an enormous distance. Uh, there, is, there are very few states in the world that could manage that today, that, that would want to, um, you know, short of, of very authoritarian states. So in fact, most, most of our young people are growing up in the knowledge that this, they will never have to face something like this. And so, on the one hand, you have this intense communion with the dead. On the other hand, they were facing a fate uh, that, that today's young people will most probably uh, not have to face. So there, there is a disconnect there coupled with an intense wish to understand, which, which is fascinating in itself. Um, we heard His Royal Highness uh, Prince William David say, 100 years on, we stand together. Now, leaving aside the current political complexities of where we find ourselves in Europe, it was an interesting phrase for him to use. I think it is, and I think it's especially relevant for Belgium. I think we forget sometimes Britain entered the First World War ostensibly to defend Belgium neutrality. It's appropriate, I think, that the link between Belgium and Britain is special for those reasons. A quarter of all the British and Empire servicemen who died in the First World War died in these fields, in this very small area. This place was always going to be special to both of those countries. It's where that bond between Britain and Belgium was, was born. It's the crucible of this relationship. You mentioned there the Empire servicemen. I, I, I mentioned uh, them too. In fact, we're going to, I think, stay with that thought and I'll ask the question later, but for now actually we're going to move on. Um, this evening's event, I mentioned there's going to be an event now. It's going to take place in, in, in the Market Square in Ypres shortly and early this evening. Uh, Dan Snow met with uh, one of the main performers, Dame Helen Mirren. Helen, what can we expect from tonight? Oh, I think this is going to be pretty spectacular tonight. You know, it'll be very emotional. How could it not be? Because we're standing right here on the spot that so many young men walked to their deaths or to inc um, uh, incredibly heroic actions. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's loaded with um, emotion, with feeling. It'll also be very stirring. There's an orchestra of a hundred uh, people. There's a beautiful young choir of a hundred young kids singing. And this incredible building behind us is going to be lit up with the most amazing um, light show. So the whole thing, I think, is going to be pretty spectacular.
And, and you're being typically modest, because of course you're playing an important part as well. What exactly are you doing? Um, well, I'm just the glue, really. I'm one of many contributors to the evening. You know, there's a, a, quite a few uh, British actors um, who are going to be there tonight. Um, but I'm just really one of the contributors. But I, I'm sort of the glue that holds sections of it together to describe exactly in, in the most simple terms, but exactly what happened historically. And you've done so many different varied jobs over the years. What's it like to be here and take part in this event? It's, it, it, it means an enormous amount to me. You know, I, I, I'm basically a child of the Second World War, but my parents' generation were very much uh, of the First World War, so I feel it's kind of in, in my history and, and in my blood, that, that particular terrible, terrible battle. Um, I lost uh, an uncle, my, my mother was the 13th, 14 children, so by the time she was born she had already lost one of her brothers, early brothers, in the, second, uh, in the First World War, so one of, literally one of my uncles was, um, was killed in, in, the, in the First World War, so um, obviously I, I feel that, that, that emotional um, um, connection with it but also much more than that in a way is every time I travel in Europe and I go to a small village in France or in Germany or in or the Netherlands or Belgium and you see the monument to the boys the lost boys of that tiny little village and there's a list of 10 or 15 or 20 names and you realize that a whole generation of young men were, were wiped out in this particular in this particular war and and so many of them lost their lives in this particular battle that we are um, commemorating today. Well, thank you for playing your part in that commemoration. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And we look forward to seeing Dame Helen Mirren later. Welcome back to uh, Tynecourt. I, I guess, David Olashoga, if I'm going to interrupt you for anyone, Dame Helen Mirren's not a bad person to interrupt you I'm, for. The, I'm honoured. The, <laughs> the thought I was beginning to ask you was really about um, Commonwealth troops, and I was going through very many uh, of the countries, the 19 combatant nations that were uh, represented tonight in that ceremony at the Menin Gate, and one that I didn't have time to mention was Nepal. Um, 90,000 Gurkhas from Nepal served in the Indian Army. That will be, it was an astonishing figure to me when I read it. Their role and their acknowledgement in that role, is enough done, do you think, to mark their contribution? I've been really pleased in this three years so far, one year to go, of centenary uh, remembrance that we have begun, I think, to make a sea change in the recognising that this was a war of empires. Britain was an empire, France was an empire, Belgium was an empire. Men from all over the world fought and laboured on the Western Front. The Western Front was the most ethnically diverse place they had ever been by 1917. And I think we're beginning, when we have these moments in these celebrations, these moments of remembrance, to remember it was, as it says on the tin, it was a world war. Yes, I, that was exactly the phrase I was going to use. And Sophie, I saw you nodding your, your head there, Professor Sophie de Sharp Driver. It was a world war, and we cannot for a minute discount that it touched every corner. Of our world. It did indeed. Uh, it touched every corner in the um, yes, in the sense of, of all, all those tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of men coming here to fight, all labour. It also touched uh, home fronts across the globe, economies, trade routes. Richard, you have been, I mean, steeped in this war for decades now. There, there's barely a part of it that you don't seem to almost sort of tangibly feel in your bones. And when I was listening to uh, King Philippe of the Belgians talk tonight, he was, I mean, poetic in parts, really. He, he seemed to sort of be trying to sum up not the facts, as we do sitting here and as you mm -hmm. so often do, but the spirit. What did you make of his attempt to do that? Do you, do you think he captured something in talking about it? The words he used were, he said, when a fresh wind whispers through the arches, it's like the fallen talking and saying, we did it for you. He said that of the men in gates. Well, absolutely, he caught that, that, that emotion that we all feel. We have such reverence for that generation of men from all corners of the globe that came here to, to Belgium and to France and lay down their lives and, and you can't help but, but feel very emotional when you see the poppies coming through the... Yes, that was a remarkable moment. Uh, a beautiful moment with the, and the, and the, the, the um, playing of the last post that we all stand here now a hundred years on saying, uh, and I said this on the Somme a year ago, a farewell to these men, there won't ever be another commemoration like this. 
this is a very important day and it's uh, and I think he caught the spirit exactly how much are you concerned I mean I noticed when I was at the men and gates watching the last post uh, ceremony a couple of nights ago that there were all sorts of people there there were some very elderly men in wheelchairs there was a toddler on top of his father's shoulders I was standing next to two sisters I think they were about nine and five years old and they seemed I don't know if they were just trying to behave themselves with their parents but they seemed genuinely interested in what was going on how much are you concerned that what you write about what you all spend your lives trying to communicate is going to be of interest to the next generation well I can only hope and pray that it is so but it, 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 it things ebb and flow I 20 years ago I was here with, or 25 years ago, I was here with the last Old Contemptibles, the regular army men. And there were 12 Old Contemptibles under the Menning Gate with 12 hel helpers and five other people. Mm. We're just looking at some pictures uh, just now in Ypres at uh, Kloss Hall, the arrivals for this evening. I mentioned that they would all be meeting each other again tomorrow at uh, Tynecott Cemetery where we are. But they're again together right now to watch what uh, promises to be a rather intriguing and remarkable creative event tonight. We're going to be watching these performances uh, along with the Duke of Cambridge, the King of the Belgians, as we see there, the Queen of the Belgians, the Duchess of Cambridge, and they're accompanied too by uh, Sir Tim Lawrence. It's going to take place in the Market Square of Ypres. It will retell the story of the Battle of Passchendaele. As we saw there from uh, Dan Snow, Dame Helen Mirren will be our narrator, Ian Hislop we also heard from earlier this evening is going to introduce a performance of his play The Wipers Times. Um, I could tell you a little bit about it but he tells me he doesn't want me to spill the beans so I won't do that. You'll have to stay tuned to see what it's all about but it promises, Lee, it promises interestingly a few laughs as well as a few very poignant moments. It's been uh, in the West End. I've seen it for myself and it's going to be touring around Britain through September and here we see their Royal Highnesses just making their way to their seats, taking their time, allowing people to uh, take their photograph and uh, those are cobblestones there and in very high heels they're not easy to negotiate so no wonder they're taking their time. There will also be some specially written extracts from War Horse by the author Michael Morpurgo and plenty of music to enjoy too including the voices of the National Youth Choir of Scotland who we heard earlier at the Menin Gate. And even for rehearsals uh, last night, the entirety of the Market Square in Ypres was full of people, crammed right up to the barriers. So it is standing room only tonight, apart, of course, from uh, the royals themselves and the other esteemed visitors who will all be taking their seats. We estimate that around about 9,000 people will be in the square of this little market town in Flanders this evening. There they are, just settling themselves down in the royal box. And it's a fine evening. Sophie, it's always nice. I feel this about Scotland, my home country. When, If it's a country that gets a lot of rain, <laughs> it's very nice to see it on a beautiful night like this, looking its very best for such a significant occasion. And so the event will be starting very soon it promises to be a feast for the eyes we will see projections we will hear from harry patch among others and it will be presented very creatively i promise i think it will be like few things that you have seen before i witnessed uh, some of the rehearsals and it was a remarkable sight
In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the lark still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' field. Passchendaele was remembered by many soldiers as the most horrific battle of the First World War. Officially called the Third Battle of Ypres, it was one of many battles that were fought in Flanders by the armies of the British Empire and her allies. Britain entered the war in 1914, following the German invasion of Belgium. The French, British and Belgian armies did all they could to stop the German advance through Europe. Two months later, in October 1914, the fighting arrived here, in Ypres. From the diary of Pastor Van Wallachem, 13th of October 1914. The sound of the guns could be heard from early in the morning. Loud, violent, getting nearer all the time. No doubt the Germans are driven back. At about half past seven in the morning, a dozen German soldiers entered the village. They had a careful look around, 
and then departed as quickly as he had come. Half an hour later, three armored cars arrived. Everyone was saying, the Germans are back, but they were English and Belgian. What a relief. Later in the afternoon, 150 French soldiers marched past Holocaust. And so, we had seen the troops of four different armies in a single day. German, Belgian, English, and French. Camille de Laren, Pastor St. Peter's Parish, Ypres. Wednesday, 14th of October, a powerful British army, about 40,000 men, admirably equipped, took possession of the city. Most were only walking through. Corporal Charlie Park, 2nd Gordon Hunters, 7th Division. 
On the 14th of October, the 7th Division, halfway to being convinced that the war would be over before they had participated, came to Ypres. We had marched 103 miles, of which the last 40 miles had been covered in under 40 hours. To the weary British, Ypres seemed as peaceful and welcoming as Lyndhurst after a long march through the New Forest. The quaint old-fashioned Flemish town lies sleepily by the side of a serene tree-shaded canal and seemed very remote from war. Sister Marie Marguerite, teacher and member of the Sisters of Mary at the La Motte Convent, Ypres. 14th to the 16th October 1914. 250 English soldiers and 60 horses were housed in our convent. Inside the town, there were still a number of British and French soldiers. All the city's ambulances, our school, were full of refugees and represented the saddest of scenes. Oh, how we pitied them. But also, sadly, they represented the desolation and destruction of our poor country, Thank you. which only yesterday so was bad. so happy and prosperous. Gunner Charlie Burroughs, Royal Field Artillery. October 18th, moved off at 4 p.m. past hundreds of refugees. All seemed terrified. They blocked the roads, and we cannot move until they get back towards Eve. We expect to be busy soon. Our officer tells us that a great battle will soon be fought here. October 19th, all the people are running for their lives. The village is burning just in front of us. As we move on, the Germans start shelling again, and we see the shells are falling all upon them. Poor things.
Corporal John Lucy, Royal Irish Rifles, November 1914. The dwindling regular battalions faced assault after assault. The fighting was tremendous and a slaughter such as none had envisaged. Practically every unit had lost three quarters of its fighting strength. Yet fresh German attacks kept coming on and more and more enemy batteries thickened the circle of guns threatening Ypres. Father Camille de Lar, pastor St. Peter's Parish, Ypres, May 1915. As I am writing, no less than five shells have fallen through the roof that shelters me. Permission to stay here has been revoked and we must evacuate before 6 p.m. The shrapnel is still exploding on the outskirts of the city. Four horses are bathing in their blood in the market square. We see bloodstains from far away in the Rue du Beur. But not a soul is alive. When the British troops arrived in Ypres, they brought with them a secret weapon, their sense of humour. In the ruins of the city, a group of soldiers from the Sherwood Foresters, led by Captain Fred Roberts and Lieutenant Jack Pearson, produced an extraordinary satirical trench newspaper, which laughed at the high command, at the horrors of the war and at their conditions. Its defiant flippancy embodied the triumph of the human spirit in the face of overwhelming adversity. Oh, to be in Flanders, now that spring is here. It's February, sir. Is it, Barnes? I find it frightfully difficult to tell. It's certainly very hot for the time of year. <laughs> Fritz's love tokens do seem to be appearing with disturbing accuracy. That's how we know the artillery's not our own. Uh, yes, thank you, Sergeant. No, but have you seen the state of the roads out there, Lieutenant? Quite appalling, full of enormous holes. I'm going to have to complain to the Ypres Town Council. <laughs> and as for the state of some of the trees... Yeah, the Bosch gunners use them for target practice, sir. Yes. They're not as popular as they used to be. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah, very good, sir. <laughs> right, usual drill. Search the place for anything we can use, preferably of the metal or timber variety. Sir? Mm. Where's this Ypres place everyone keeps talking about? Ypres is what the Belgians call wipers. Ah, right, sir. Funny lot, the Belgians. It's like that Napu rum they have over here. I never seem to get any. Napu is from the French god, Il Nion Aplou. There is no more. Well, why did they just say that, sir? There's nothing here, sir. Napu salvage, sir. Very good, Don. We'll make a sapper of you yet. Hey, take a look at this, sir. What the bloody hell is that? Well, that, Barnes, is an Arab. I'm not stupid, Sant. <laughs> the Arab is an Anglo-American hand-fed platen press. It's a manual pedal-operated printing machine. And it is a work of art. So shall we smash it up? No. Hey, hey. How on earth do you know all this, Tyler? I used to be a printer in Civvy Street, sir. Really? Can you make it work? Well, she's been knocked about a bit. Had some unwelcome visitors, but uh, give it a bit of time, yes, sir. I reckon so. Splendid. Because we're going to borrow it. Isn't that looting, sir? No. No, it's the temporary requisitioning of civilian facilities for military purposes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like looting to me. <laughs> you ever done any journalism, Pearson? Good God, no. Excellent. Me neither. Because what we are going to do, boys, is produce a newspaper. Aren't we, Sergeant? If you say so, sir. What, like the Daily Mail? No. I was thinking of something rather more accurate. And what shall we call this publication? The Ypres Times. Huh? Ypres, sir? Oh, it's not going to be in Belgian, is it? <laughs> we all call it Wipers, sir. Yeah. Hmm. Very well. The Wipers Times. Right. You heard the captain? We have a newspaper to produce. <laughs> so, will the Wipers Times address the big issues of the war? Of course. 
We'll write the first thing that comes into our heads and fill the rest with advertisements. There might be a slight problem with potential advertisers, such as you know, shops, restaurants, theatres, small businesses, etc, etc. What problem? There aren't any. Uh, They've all been blown to buggery. Uh, is that anywhere near Popper ringy? No, it isn't. You didn't hear that, did you, men? No, sir. But it was most amusing. I'm sure we can find some advertisements. Fred, you are an incorrigible optimist. <laughs> Optimism. Now, there's a dangerous thing, particularly in a war. Jack, do you suffer from optimism? Men! Are you suffering from optimism? Many are and don't know the telltale signs. Is it serious, Doctor? I just need you to answer a few questions. Do you wake up in the morning feeling all is going well for the Allies? Yes, Doctor. Do you sometimes think the war will end within the next 12 months? Absolutely, Doctor. Do you consider our leaders competent to conduct the war to a successful issue? I should say so, Doctor. Oh, dear. This is the worst case of cheerfulness I've encountered. But don't worry. I'm writing something for you now which should cure you completely. Is it a prescription, Doctor? No. It's your orders. I'm sending you to the front line. Thank you, Doctor. Take a wilderness of ruin, spread with mud some six feet deep. In this mud now cut some shadows, then you have the line we keep. Now you get some wild and spiky, throw it round outside your line. Get some biggest, drive it tightly, and from these your wild and twine. Get a lot of huns and plant them in a ditch across the way. Ypres stood between the German army and the coastal ports. Right here, the Allies halted the German advance in what became known as the First Battle of Ypres. After fighting to a stalemate, both sides dug in, forming the Western Front, a 440-mile trench system that snaked from the North Sea to Switzerland. To the east of the city, the German army held the high ground, small hills that dominated the area. The Allies were surrounded on three sides in what came to be called the Ypres Salient. The Second Battle of Ypres in the spring of 1915 saw the German army launch a major gas attack here for the first time. The Allies were driven back. But the line held, just. Their foothold became smaller, the pressure even more intense. Fighting in the salient was continuous. Over a million men marched along the main inn road, many passing through this square on their way to the front line. Shelled constantly, it was one of the most dangerous places on the Western Front. Every regiment and corps of the British Army would serve here. And by 1917, thousands were wounded or killed every month, just holding the line. In the summer of 1917, the Allies began a major offensive to push back the German army and to finally break out of their precarious positions in the salient. On the 31st of July, after two weeks of intense shelling, 
the infantry attack was launched. The Third Battle of Ypres would rage for the following 100 days and eventually come to an end at a small village on the high ground, Passchendaele. This is the story of that battle told by the men who were there. I was 19 years of age. I was in the front line trench at Passchendaele. Now Passchendaele, when I knew it, was flat. Everything was blown to pieces. On that morning, the 31st of July, we were told we were going over the top. The terrain was very, very difficult. Shell holes, some of them you could drop a house in. We entered the front line. Shell holes over shell holes, all filled with water. On the other side, there were the snipers, and they, they were very good marksmen. And uh, the artillery fired at everyone whom they saw uh, in these uh, fields. About eight o'clock in the morning, one of those whiz bang <coughs> shell landed about two feet under me and blew me right over. <coughs> the whole place and my section was almost buried but fortunately the shell did not explode thank god the air was boiling with the turmoil of the shells flying through it we were thrown about in the aircraft rocking from side to side being thrown up and down Below us was mud, filth, smashed trenches, wreckage of aeroplanes, bits of men. And uh, as we came out of it, I felt that we had escaped from one of the worst evil things that I have ever seen at any time in any of the flying that occurred to me during that war. I'll wager a hat full of guineas Against all of the songs you can sing That someday you'll love And the next day you'll lose And winter will turn into spring And the snow falls The wind calls And the year turns round again and like barley corn, who rose from the grave, a new year will rise up again. Father used to tell me that when he was a little un, he used to get himself in all sorts of trouble. He always said, that the worst scrape he got himself into was the First World War. And the worst battle he was in was at Passchendaele. And he was there all because of an horse. He was a farm boy when the war broke out. Fifteen, that's all. Like me, he didn't get a lot of schooling. 
He always said you could learn most of what was worth knowing from keeping your eyes and ears peeled. Anyway, that's by the by. Father had this young colt, Joey, he called him. Broke him to alter. Broke him Good to ride. Oh, Broke him to plow. Grew up together, they did. Best friends. Meant the world to each other. <laughs> and if ever that horse got sick, father would bed down beside him in his stable till he was better. And loved that horse like a brother he did. Now, father weren't old enough yet to join up, but Joey was. Father was busy with Joey out in the fields. He wasn't thinking about the war. He was thinking about his plowing. He didn't know the army were coming to the village looking for good sturdy horses to buy for the cavalry, for pulling guns or ammunition wagons or ambulances. They needed all the horses they could get. And they were paying good money too. Come on, Joey. It were his own father who done it. Done it without telling him. Done it behind his back. His father took Joey up to the village and sold him off to the army. Father, no, no, father! 40 pounds he got for him. Albert squared up to his father and told him just what he thought of him said goodbye to his mother and told them he was off to join up to find his Joey and bring him home. Nothing they could say would stop him. Now, there's millions of men over there at the front in Belgium and millions of horses too. Needling an haystack, you might think. Father told me and you'd be right. Just staying alive was the difficult bit. The worst was at the Battle of Passchendaele. He always said that. Hell on earth, he called it. For men and horses both. The horses died. Just the same way the men did. Shell fire, machine gun fire, bob wire. And every horse, father saw, dead or alive, he thought it might be his Joey. Then, at first light, one grey, misty morning, father's on stand two in the trenches, on lookout for German attack. And he looks out through the mist, and he sees something moving out there. Not a German, not a cow, but a horse. A horse in no man's land. Well, he never thinks twice. He loves horses, all horses. So he's got to go out there and fetch him in, hasn't he? Quick as a twig, father is up and over the top and stumbling through the mud towards this horse. Trouble is, there's this German bloke doing just the same thing. And he's waving a white flag. No one shoots. So the two of them, a Fritz and a Tommy, had a nice little chat. So what do we do now? The German spoke a little English. Father didn't know hardly a word of German. We don't want to start a war now, do we? <laughs> the German bloke laughs, takes a coin out of his pocket, holds it up and says, I have a good idea, Tommy. Let us toss for the horse. You call. Seemed like a fair idea to father, so he calls. Hats.
That, I am afraid to say, is the face of my Kaiser looking up at me. He does not look pleased. The two of them shook hands and wished each other well. Auf Wiedersehen, Tommy. Same to you, Fritz. So, Father won, and you guessed it. When they got that horse back to the veterinary hospital and cleaned him down, and that took some doing, Father said, it was his Joey standing there. I'd take some believing, I know. But it's true enough, I'm telling you. Father always said he and Joey were the lucky ones. They came home at the end of the war. And the whole village was there to meet them. Bells ringing, band playing, flags flying. But all Father could think of, he told me, as they rode up into the village that day were the millions of men and horses on all sides for whom the bells were not ringing, the band not playing, who were not coming home. The lambkin in the manger, the light upon the leaf, the moorland yields to glory, the shepherds bend the knee. And all are wrapped in grace, and all are gifted worth. Peace walks upon this blessed land. Peace walks upon this blessed land. Peace walks upon this blessed land. The second day it began to rain, and rained continuously, so that the bog of Passchendaele spread out into a lake. And to begin with, we were sitting um, up to our knees in mud and water. Now, the mud at Passchendaele was very viscous indeed, very tenacious. But it also stuck to you all over. It slowed you down. It got into the bottom of your trousers. Um, and you were covered with mud. It drew at you, not like a quicksand, but a, a, a real a monster that sucked at you. Because of the mud, there were no trenches, just shell holes. That forward line was made of shell holes. The men uh, were wet to the skin day after day. Their overcoats were plastered with mud. So you can imagine how hard it was to move at all. I remember very well uh, trying to assist a lad. We called to him. I said, are you hit, son? He said, yes, I am, a little. There was no hope of getting to him. He's in the middle of this huge sea of mud. And uh, the look on the lad's face was really pathetic, but I couldn't do a thing. Had I bent a little more, I'd have gone in with him, as so many did. I don't know how far the duckboards extend in, but each side was a sea of mud. And you stumbled and slugged along if you slipped. You went up to, to the waist, possibly. Not only that, but in every pool, decomposed bodies of humans and mules, perhaps both. And if you were wounded and slipped off, well, then that was the end of it.
Incredibly, the Wipers Times continued to be produced throughout the war, even though the Sherwood Foresters were involved in the heaviest fighting, with both editors, Roberts and Pearson, winning the Military Cross. Amidst all the carnage, including the Battle of Passchendaele, the paper's mix of subversive humour, silly jokes and poignant poems provided an unlikely but very British form of morale boosting, and the Wipers Times was hugely popular in the trenches. Zero minus four! So what's the plan, sir? All we've got to do, Jack, is increase the print run, up the cover price, bring in some new writers. You don't think you might be getting rather obsessed with the Wipers Times? Obsessed? I'm not obsessed. Sergeant Tyler? Sir? Any new submissions to the paper? Bleeding hundreds. Excellent. You haven't read them, Fred. Oh, please tell me it isn't all poetry. Fine. It isn't all poetry. But that's a lie. It is all poetry. Damn and blast. Alert the medical orderlies. We, we have an outbreak of poetitis. Where's Henderson? Oh, sorry, sir. Call of nature. <laughs> Number two ammo dump. Oh. There is the detail, Hendo. I'll tell you what, though, that Wipers Times does what he says on the cover. Very handy. Oh. Do you ever get used to the noise, Barnsey? It's not so bad. Are you joking? What did you do before you joined up? Worked on a farm. Uh, I worked down the mines. So this is a picnic. And I was a machine worker digging on the underground. So you won't hear us complaining about the noise? No, I won't, because it's so bloody noisy. <laughs> nice one, Doddy. Zero minus three! So what do you really think of the poetry? I think poetry is essential to the modern battlefield, sir. A bit like mud. If only it were just mud. Yeah, probably better not to dwell on the unmentionables. Best left unsaid. Well, that's why I'd rather think about the paper. You know, it's important to me because... Well, because it's not important. Oh, dear. You're getting aphoristic. Am I? My apologies. Excuse me for asking, sir, but there's a rumour going round. Is this the big push? I'm afraid such information's a bit hush-hush, Dot. Who on earth told you that? The Germans, sir. They're shouting out across no man's land. Yes, well, perhaps not the best kept military secret in the history of the British Army. However, I do have some good news, lads. Sir? All you men are to receive chevrons. Uh, what's a chevron, sir? It's a small V-shaped piece of coloured cloth, Yates, to be sewn onto your tunic to denote active service overseas. How we've managed to sleep at night without our chevrons is one of the astounding features of the war. If only I got me blooming chevrons, sir, I could die happy. <laughs> Zero minus two! Run, Russian Sergeant. Is there time to give the boys a toss? Yes, sir. She's son. Dodge too young, I love his. Yeah, we don't want you incapable, Henderson. How would you tell, sir? <laughs> Any chance of seconds? No, lad. Bad for your health. Have some water. Water? Water's not for drinking, Sergeant. It's for putting in the radiators of the staff officers' cars. <laughs> don't do anything that's risky. Forget the water. Try some whiskey. <laughs> One minute. No jokes, then. Bit short on jokes. There are various types of courage. There are many kinds of fear. There are many brands of whiskey. There are many makes of beer. There is also rum, which sometimes in our need can help us much. <laughs> but tis whiskey. Whiskey. Whiskey hands the courage which, which is Dutch. Dutch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> On the signal, company will advance. Whiskey, there are many makes of beer. There is also rum, which sometimes in our need can help so much. But it's whiskey, 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 and the courage which is Dutch. Whiskey, 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 has the courage which is Dutch.
Over the whole of Passchendaele, there was a smell. It was a sweet smell. It was a smell of decaying bodies or decayed bodies, men, mules. Now, you got this smell more strongly and more strongly as you got towards the front line because the shells were churning it up. You see, the ground was full of these dead bodies. And over that was a very strong smell, and if it got stronger, it was dangerous. It was chlorine gas. Dear Mrs. Morris, I do hope you will have this note before learning from the War Office. Your son, Lieutenant J.G. Morris, was admitted to our ambulance about nine o'clock this morning, suffering from abdominal wounds, and is very dangerously ill. He was operated on shortly after admission. Is just as well as we can expect. He's young and strong, and we hope with God's help to pull him round for you. I will write again tomorrow and tell you how he is. Need I say how deeply we sympathize with you in your anxiety for your brave lad. Yours sincerely, Sister Annie Wright. I remember these wounded men hanging on to the edge of these duck boards, you see, with their body about half submerged in, in the mud. And uh, some of these fellows, not knowing they were there, would step on their fingers, you know. And the screams, oh, golly, just haunts you, you know. But strict orders, you couldn't help them, you couldn't do a damn thing, you just had to keep going. Dear Mrs. Morris, your son, I'm sorry to say, is not nearly so well this morning. He had a very restless night, and his condition causes much anxiety. He does not appear conscious of pain and takes no interest in life. We'll write again tomorrow. I am so sorry for you, so far away from your boy, but we give him all possible care, believe me. Yours sincerely, Annie Wright. I came across a Cornishman. He was ripped from his shoulder to his waist with shrapnel. And directly we got to him, he said, shoot me. Before we could pull a revolver, 30 seconds, he was dead. He just said one word, mother. Dear Mrs. Morris, your wire came this morning just an hour too late, your dear boy having passed peacefully away at nine o'clock. Sister Rickard was with him. She took this little piece of hair for you. She also put some white flowers in his hands in your name, and she was very, very good to him. It may be of some comfort for you to know he didn't suffer. I cannot tell you how sorry we are not to have been able to save him for you. But really, if you'd only seen how wearied he'd looked, you would not grudge him rest. With deepest sympathy with all his friends, yours sincerely, Annie Wright. Land is low, like. 
Like a huge imprisoning hole. I hear a heart that's sound and a high. I hear the heart within me cry. My darling Lizzie, at last I have the opportunity of writing to you a real letter. In the first place, dearest, I trust you and the children are quite well. I'm sorry to say that nearly all the boys from the seventh that came out with me have gone under, poor fellows. We are expecting to go up again in two or three days, so dearest, pray hard for me. Dear Lizzie, it's nearly six months now since I saw you. How I long for you and the children. God bless you all. I love you more than ever. I long to take you in my arms again. What a lot of love we have missed. But please, God, it will make it all the sweeter when I see you. I often take your photo out of my pocket, and I look at your dear face and think of the times we have had together. Some lovely days, eh, love? And when I think again of some of the worry I have caused you, it makes me only the more eager to get home to you, to atone for all the worry and anxious moments you have had to put up with. Out here, dear, we're all pals. What one hasn't got, the other has. We try to share each other's troubles, get each other out of danger. You wouldn't believe the humanity between men out here. Please, God, it won't be long before this war is over. We are pushing old Fritz back, and don't think he will stand the British boys much longer. And then we will try and keep a nice home. I will know the value of one now. Well, darling, I don't think I can say any more at present. Good night, love. God bless you and my children, and may he soon send me back to those I love, is the wish of your faithful husband, Jack. When Jack's letters stopped, every effort was made by his family to find him. On the 4th of December, 1917, Lizzie received a telegram informing her that Private Jack Mudd, 24th Battalion, London Regiment, was missing, presumed dead. It's no worse. There is precious little glamour about modern war seen on the spot. Squalor is its means and destruction its end. Everyone is homeless, and the homeless man, for all his heroic cheerfulness, a most forlorn fellow. And so, here stands Talbot House, 
a refuge behind the lines, where British soldiers of all ranks can escape. All rank abandon ye who enter here. It was plain that it was up to the chaplains to open a place of their own, an institutional church to provide happiness for men, and also, if possible, a hostel for officers going on leave. And here I am, chaplain to the forces. I am a comic kind of creature in officer's kit, but people are getting used to me and my queer, unmilitary way. My job here is of the kind I more or less understand, i.e. being friendly to all comers without any of the regimental business to bother me. <laughs> Come along in and have a look around. Uh, don't dally on the doormat, it is a custom to neglect. Here is the entrance hall. On the left hand, its walls are covered with maps, not of the war, but of Blighty. See how the London we love, without knowing it is worn away by the faithful fingers of your fellow citizens. Looking straight through the hall, you catch a glimpse of a well-kept garden where men bask as in St. James's Park. Come into the garden and forget about the war.
Lieutenant Edmund Blunden, MC, fought at Third Eaps. He would later recall vividly entertainment behind the lines in his poem, Concert Party, Bussenboom. The stage was set, the house was packed, the famous troupe began. Our laughter thundered act by act, time light as sunbeams ran. Dance sprang and spun and neared and fled. Jest chirped at gayest pitch. Rhythm dazzled, action sped most comically rich. With generals and lame privates both, such charms worked wonders. Till the show was over, lagging loath, we faced the sunset chill. And standing on the sandy way, with the cracked church peering past, we heard another matinee. We heard the maniac blast of barrage south by St. Aloy, and the red lights flaming there, called madness. Come, my bonny boy, and dance to the latest air. To this new concert, white we stood, cold certainly held our breath, while men in tunnels below larch wood were kicking men to death. By the end of 1917, the city of Ypres was in ruins, and the magnificent cloth hall reduced to rubble. On the 10th of November, British and Canadian forces finally secured the village of Passchendaele, and the offensive was called off. Paul Nash served on the Ypres salient in early 1917. Following an injury, he returned as an, an official war artist in the final stages of the battle. On the 13th of November 1917, he wrote home to his wife, Margaret. I have just returned last night from a visit to brigade headquarters up the line and I shall not forget it as long as I live. I have seen the most frightful nightmare of a country more conceived by Dante or Poe than by nature. It's unspeakable, utterly indescribable. In the 15 drawings I have made, I may give you some idea of its horror, but only in being in it and of it can ever make you sensible of its dreadful nature and of what our men have to face. We all have vague notions of the terror of a battle, but no pen or drawing can convey this country. The rain drives on. The stinking mud becomes more evilly yellow. 
The shell holes fill up with green white water. The roads and tracks are covered in inches of slime. The black dying trees ooze and sweat, and the shells never cease. They plunge into the grave which is this land. One huge grave, and cast up on it the poor dead. It is unspeakable, godless, and hopeless. I am no longer an artist interested and curious. I am a messenger who will bring back word from the men who are fighting to those who want the war to go on forever. Feeble, inarticulate will be my message, but it will have a bitter truth, and may it burn their lousy souls. Ashendale was the infantryman's graveyard. We called it the slaughterhouse. And even the most seasoned veteran felt he'd be lucky if he got there and came back. There was no chance of getting wounded and getting a blighty one at Passchendaele. You would either get through or die. The day we came out of Passchendaele, I think that was the day that uh, I was most scared of all. I mean, throughout the war, you, you didn't sort of anticipate being killed. When you saw chaps killed, well, you sort of felt, well, you know, this is the war. It was only when a friend of yours was killed that you really felt it. The worst thing for me was passion down. That's where we were already right in the thick of it, and uh, it, it was just horrible. The, the mud the shocking ways of life. Passchendaele. I would say that people came out of Passchendaele simply numb. Numb, mentally and physically. And I wouldn't have thought that many of us would have recovered from it. But say La Guerre and uh, one good leave does an awful lot for a man, you know. When I was out there the last time, we went to one of the biggest German cemeteries. And then you go and you see the English stones. And it makes you sick to see all the stones, all people who died. It's all wrong.
Well, as this evening's events draw to a close, we remember the troops who 100 years ago were about to launch the first attack of the Battle of Passchendaele. It would last for 103 days and epitomize the horror of the First World War, the appalling conditions and the staggering loss of life. It was a moment in history that would mark humanity with a deep and lasting wound. Join us tomorrow when we commemorate the centenary of the battle here at Tynecott Cemetery and we remember the thousands of men who were killed and wounded at Passchendaele. We'll be back on BBC One tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. From all of us here, for now, good night. <laughs>